Welcome, listeners, to Le Grand Booth. The Big Feast. With myself, film critic Cole Smithy, and my co-host, filmmaker Mike Lacey. I got asked recently what films I've made, because uh, I was identified as a filmmaker on this. Uh-huh. And I was like, well, I made one about a mannequin. Actually, did I, I do have a short film that I assist and directed mm-hmm. that is winning various internet film festival type things. It seems like there are festivals which, quote, happen monthly, mm. which you can submit to. And along with 15 other nominees, you could potentially win a prize. I don't want to say that they seem like basically awards farms, uh-huh. but that's exactly what they might be. Mm. But a little, little short that I worked on called The Other Capula is doing some little mini things. So that's cool. Mm-hmm. That's kind of fun. So if somebody wanted to find that on YouTube, where can they find it? Um, not yet. You know, it's still in the circle of films that are hitting um, festivals to try to get a little reputation there. You don't want to just put it on the internet quite yet. But I don't know. Maybe when you're listening to this in the future, you can find the other Capulet. What about the, what about the, the one that you made in, in Cannes? Um, you can always see my role as Woody Allen, uh, revealing him to be the maniac we know him to be now, uh, called Reproduced and... I'm sorry. Re- reproduced and Damaged. That's what it was. It's, it was a play on uh, Seduced and Abandoned, which is a documentary about the Cannes Fist of can f- film festival starring and made by James Toback who himself is very poorly regarded as he should be. Yeah, I, I almost thought you were going to say the, the can film fisting. I didn't know you were do, you were doing porn. You know, I mean we're we're beating around the bush so to speak here uh about French film and problematic uh sex relations. I think that all serve us appropriately for this movie and uh, next week's episode. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I want to say, cause we're, we're right in the, in the middle of our four French films to in, intro 2018. And it really makes me realize how much I love French films and how much better the French are as storytellers. I have long, long held the belief that the French are much better filmic storytellers than just about anybody else. And our little foray here into the four French films that we're experiencing, they're so different than anything that you would see from any other co- country. And the w- just the way they tell stories and the depths that they go to, it, it's it's nothing like what you see in American films. And if you, and if you think about how the French new wave was what informed the golden era of uh, American film making in the seventies, you can see where, you know, why that was such a rich vein for them to tap into. I'll, I'll play the, the devil's advocate. And maybe I do have, a lot of reservations about this film that we're talking about today. And I'll ask you, yeah, break it down for me as you see it. What is, what is uh, different and, and, and positive about this, the storytelling style in this? I will say I was definitely engaged, but confused about what the traditional uh, plot line was, what was the intention and obstacle that was clearly being overcome. Um, and I, th- I think it's probably there. Uh, but it, it is told in a very unusual fashion, and it's different than the new wave. This is uh, mid '80s French filmmaking, and definitely a different type of story being told here. And uh, Andre Andre Tashin or Tashin is the uh, filmmaker, and we'll talk more about him in, in a second. But I, I do want to talk about the beer that I chose uh, for the podcast. It is from. It's My Bloody Valentine Ale from Alesmith. There's just about every product out there called My Bloody Valentine, be it a band, a movie, um, I'm sure a greeting card company. It's got a nice bloody heart with an arrow going through it. And there's certainly uh, some 
dissatisfaction, so romantic dissatisfaction in this movie. Mm-hmm. And so I thought it would. Oh, there's a there's a couple men who don't have their hearts' desires uh, realized, and they don't have their hearts in the right place, and they don't have their hearts where they say they are, and they might not have hearts. Some of them. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, th- this beer, it's six point six six. ABV. Very scientific. Very evil. And uh, so I'll just read I'll just read the little blurb, the Ale Smith blurb. Don't spend this single awareness day alone. Grab a beer. This red blooded cousin of Evil Dead Red Ale, our Halloween brew, is a beautiful crimson color. Indeed it is very reddish. Notes of caramel toast and bittersweet chocolate balance an intense bouquet of floral hop aromas that we know you'll fall in love with. So the finish leaves a pleasant full bodied sweetness on the palate that won't spread angry rumors about you. And uh, I don't, I don't know. Let's see. What do you think? Have you tasted it? It's spicy. I like that. It's warm. It's kind of like stepping mm. into a, a tasty bath. <laughs> taste <laughs> that's weird to say it was weird a taste a tasty bath it's like mm. it's kind of a mixed metaphor but yeah I, I taste the chocolate they said toast right like 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 charred bread yeah notes of hmm. caramel toast and a bittersweet chocolate caramel comma toast is there caramel toast that could be good yeah. i don't like caramel in a lot of context but i feel like on toast i could get into it pair this beer with jilted lovers <laughs> okay <laughs> which I which I think we we certainly have. Uh, I think we have. Yeah, this we is have, we have jilted lovers in this in this movie. This is one of the better uh, mashups between the film and beer, certainly. So, Andre Tashin, this is one of his earlier efforts, and he co-wrote this with Olivier Assayas. Are you familiar with him? Yeah, I've seen a couple. He did a later Juliette Binoche film, Clouds of Sils Maria, that came out a few years ago. Yeah, I thought that movie was awful. I dug that movie. Oh, did you really? I, I did, I did. I couldn't tell you exactly what it's about, but um, I, uh, I, found it, I found it compelling and, and not that different from this. I thought that there was a lot of um, tonal connection between sort of forced romance and um, these intense implied relationships that's definitely more grounded in human than this these characters are a bit archetypical chickens with their heads cut off uh it's well his is for my money uh olivier say best film is late le destinés which is a belle epoque uh movie about southwest france yeah i haven't seen that one and that's a great one from from 2000 so yeah so back to the um, this movie, I'm trying to find the, the year on this thing. It's 85, is that right? I thought it was 86, but 85 or 6. And, um, you know, the the subtitle of this could be, She's New in Town. Yeah, yeah, 1985. And I, I just want to see where this movie falls in uh, Andre Tachin's uh, oeuvre, if you will. I'm, I'm also interested how many films Julie Binoche had been in in this because she's, she's so young. She's she's very young. Um, she looks uncomfortably young as just the actress in this role. And to to imagine a person being put um, through these things is is very intense. But she's terrific. She's so great. So naturalistic in her performance. So Tashin had been making films since 1965. He made a documentary short. In 65, so he was very well established uh, before he, he came to, to this film. But in the, this movie has all the trappings of a, of a classic mid-80s French sensibility where it has this theatrical uh, narrative underpinning. It has this heightened romanticism. It's er, er, eroticism, really. And eroticism. I think... The eroticism is more there than the romanticism. No, I think the rom- the romanticism, at least uh, in relation to the um, to, uh, to the poetry, Polo, uh, okay, and to the uh, you know because he she's maybe, in, maybe, because she's an actress. Maybe it's it's more to do with uh, the genre of romanticism 
like literature almost more this sort of yeah. epicness and appeals to um explicitly Romeo and Juliet I have to say there are I'm a bit tired having just worked on one myself of movies using Romeo and Juliet as a specific grounding yeah. reference space to, yeah. to give itself uh, romantic and literary gravitas. It's, um, you know, this was a lot earlier than the things that I'm thinking about, but it, to me at this point, it feels hack. If you're writing a screenplay, if you're writing a short film, if you're writing anything and you want to, give it a, a, a bit more oomph. Don't reference a great piece of art like Romeo and Juliet and just sort of call your characters star-crossed and not really develop them in any way. Not not accusing you right now of this movie of doing that, but there are... But it has become a, a very hackneyed trope. Definitely. And so, let, let's just set up the story a, a little bit because really at, at its heart, it's a love triangle, but there's more to it than that. So... Juliette Binoche is looking for an apartment, and she soon. But she's an actress. She's an actress, and she's very and she's very uh, at ease with using her her sexuality to get what she, to get an apartment, to get a place to sleep, just to do, just to to exist. It's yeah. I want to be precise with the way she uses her. Or engages with her sexuality. She's is, very open about it. She tells it. She tells anyone that she sleeps with everybody. She she does, but then immediately people cross very intense lines with her. You know, we have the guy who's helping get her the apartment, Paulo, who they spend the night walking around. It's one of these your you know your late teens, early twenties, extreme romantic nights, and you can tell that the wheels are turning in his head as he's trying to like help her find a place that he thinks he's going to get laid that night and she rebuffs him and he responds in a way that you would think she would never talk to him again it's very on the uh, on the, on the first night what 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 does he do on the first night isn't the first night when he winds up putting her up in a hotel room and she he sh- uh, she shuts the door on him right. and he pushes the door in basically attacking her to get in bed with her and then runs down the staircase. Is is that Polo or is or it's is Polo. And then later uh-huh. his roommate, Quentin, comes and played by by Lambert Wilson. And much more explicitly does the same thing. Uh, like rapes her. Yeah. Yeah. I think he uh actually commits the act instead of just sort of threatening to do it. So there is a parallel between these two um, where Paulo is a bit meeker. He only threatens to attack her sexually. Quentin goes through with it, and then there's a triangle between them for a bit, although Quentin soon dies in a car accident. And in the meantime, she is... Well, kind of as a result of that, she meets a director who had been casting Quentin, who had heretofore had been working... At yeah, a you're sex really, show. Yeah, you're really you're really zipping through the whole. Yeah. The whole. Yeah, I'm whole zipping through it. There. So we'll, we'll, we let's let's sit on there. But yeah, let's, so there's let's go back to the love triangle between Quentin, Paulo, and uh, Benoche's character. Well, so it it has a lot to do with the with the way that people these characters present themselves because Paulo presents himself as this very good hearted character. He looks incredibly like Robert De Niro circa taxi driver, by the way. And, uh, and he, yeah. and he even wears a little skinnier, but he even wears the, the green but, co- combat fatigue but this, at, at one point. But that's misleading because he's, he's, he's the, uh, the nice guy. Yeah. You he, know, the he, beta male. Yeah. He pre- he presents himself as, as the nice guy. He, he works for a, a realty firm. So he has contacts to get her an apartment, but then he, uh, he tries to seduce her a couple a couple of times. Yeah, immediately upon bringing her to the apartment, he just pulls off her clothes, and she's. Well, this is the yeah uh, the, the this scene is later. Oh, this, oh, this is after he's found her after, place. Yeah, yeah, this is after yeah. he's he's found her a place, yeah. and and her it, it, reaction is to just take all of her clothes off, lay on the floor, and say, "Okay, come on, get it over with. Do what you want to do. Yeah, this is what you want to treat me like a piece of meat. Go ahead, do it. You know, and um, yeah. What's your reaction to? How, how, where do you think that this character is at? She's 18, 19 years old. 
this is not her making love to somebody. Like she has a relationship with her body is seeing it as like people treat her a certain way and she's willing to allow people to continue doing that. Well, she, she presents herself that way, you know, because the, the, the first words out of her mouth are, you know, I sleep with everybody, you know, that's how I got my last apartment. And then she just breaks up with that boyfriend and then she goes and finds somebody else to sleep with so she can get another place to sleep. She's really, it seems that she, she's an actress whose only concern is, uh, getting a, a get, putting her career forward it, she's i don't know she seems she I, seems to be you know when she talks talks to the uh the stage manager of the play that she's in what's it called coffee or chocolate tea or chocolate coffee or chocolate yeah tea or tea or coffee or tea or chocolate it's a, it's a, supposed to be a incredibly bad play that yeah. you have a sense plays for a month and Six people laugh the entire time it runs. Yeah. It's, it's awful. Yeah, pretty bad. But, um, you know, Benoche plays this character, I'd say, very nuanced and, and damaged. Um, there's a lot going on behind her eyes that aren't, it's not necessarily in the script. Um, you know, while I wouldn't ever, like, say it as an insult, you can call someone, um, she doesn't come off as, as slutty, you know, qualifying that with, not that there, it would be anything wrong with that if she was, but that's that's not quite how I see it. I think she sees more resigned that she at least believes that she understands. It's like she's learned in her small town before she moved to Paris that this is how things work. So she's she's giving in a bit. And I think you get a sense that maybe she's used to that from before. But this is not... Um, yeah, remember she, we watched Babyface? Remember that? Yeah, she, she's from Toulouse. That's, that's her hometown. She's from Toulouse. So yeah. we watched Babyface. Babyface was about a woman who uses her sexuality in almost a sociopathic way to climb up the ladder. Yeah, a very cunning, cunning way. That's very much not, that's not the way person. that this is being portrayed. No, no. She, the, she, this character really seems to the fly by the seat of her, of her pants, but she's really fearless. Nina uh, is the, is the character. So already the point where we're at and talking about the plot is where this is a confusing story to me is because there are men and love interests flying in left and right. You feel this kind of claustrophobic sense that um, that sh there are just uh, an overwhelming number of, of, of people coming at her. How could you ever relax? They literally, scene by scene, she's getting letters from one guy, accosted by another one, someone else is, is showing up. And not only is that an interesting way to show what it's like to be an attractive woman trying to make it in Paris and be an actress, it's also, storytelling-wise, conventionally very very confusing who who are, are we rooting for someone yeah. is 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 there an arc of a romance is it Paulo is it Quentin is it like she's with this guy F Fred at the beginning who doesn't disappear and then comes back who disappears and then comes back it's not it's, it's very, not a simple no, meet no, it's, it's very it's very episodic and all of the guys that she uh runs into while objectively handsome they're really brutal people. The, it's very dark. Yeah, it's very the, these these guys. None of them are what you would call good people. I mean, these are assholes. You're not. Yeah, you're not hoping for any of them to get together, and that's why it's it's it's. I mean, the Quentin character is such a, a clear sociopath from the yeah. beginning. He, well, he rapes her. Yeah, yeah, and, and and then but but she's but she stays with him and he be, he drags her around, he'll grab her and just pull her into a train station and you know, push her around and it's it's reminds me of I saw Itania recently and I thought that did a a good portrayal of why people stay with their abusers and though we see um and remind me what Benoche's character is, or what her name is. Um Oh, Nina. Oh, Nina, right. Like, while well, Nina is hopping from guy to guy, she's staying in the same type of relationship. She even, I think, later in the film, tries to turn a more fraternal relationship into one of this emotionally, sexually abusive Well, then she goes in the bar, she's with Quentin, and she picks up this other guy, 
just on the spot buy me a drink for for safety this is yeah this is her language and her way of uh, the only way she knows to have she can't say hey there's a creepy guy trying to hurt me you know yeah i think the right the smarter move is to go up to a woman and say there's a fucking creep out there can you hang out with me and walk me home instead she hits on a guy pretends she's going to take him home and then he winds up beating up quentin and now quentin is injured so she's a she's a she's a master of of mixed signals she's she's a master of getting herself into worse situations she she just constantly sends mixed signals and it gets her into an escalating amount of of trouble and you know even things just the way that the characters communicate is very interesting when quentin is telling her about this man who who stalks him and calls him all the time and i would think if some you know if i was in her position and he told me that i would think well are you gay what are you talking about like some man is pursuing you all the time and of course we find out that that's not the the situation at all is the the it's a director played by Jean-Louis Trentignat who has worked with Quentin before and knew Quentin had cast Quentin in a adaptation of Romeo and Juliet. And they were in a car together and the actress who he was romantically involved with was playing Juliet and she died in Which, the car in the car. Accident. Was it his daughter? Was it the director's daughter? I, don't, I thought that might have been a I dot I shouldn't have I connected, but I don't, that might have been the case. I don't remember that. Well, I, I, I want to go back for one second and say it's like, I don't want to, you know, as the parlance is victim blame um, the character for just sending out confusing signals. She she is being systematically abused by shitty people. But you do have to say it's it's there's a bit that's definitely true to life in um, when people are in situations like this repeatedly that clearly this is a type of relationship she's comfortable with and yep. it seems to be her unconscious motivation to seek out those familiar relationships over actually pursuing her career strategically you know she mm-hmm. quits her job in one play to hang out with Quentin even though she doesn't seem to even want to but she is compelled to spend time yeah, with it seems it seems like a, a completely unmotivated decision that she makes there it, it, but i think that unmotivation and the irrationality of it is what you want to dig out about the character is that yeah, she does seem to constantly turn back to these people who put her in these awful situations like when she sleeps w- with quentin and then paulo comes to check in on her and in and, and quentin brings him into the room with her sleeping naked and has paulo like touch her in her crotch while she's asleep to see who she likes best it's it's horribly creepy. It's it's terrible. You like, get away from these men immediately, and you know, she doesn't. And mm-hmm. and you know, I, what's going on in Toulouse, man? <laughs> I know. Well, what's going on in Paris is the real question. Yeah. Um, no, it, it, it's true. She she's for some reason she's damaged goods. She's uh, she. We don't know anything about her history, but for her to be seeking this kind of I don't know what you would even call it. Just abusive cycle. Abusive relationships and, and, and to fall into them so easily, you know, she, she just exists with them. She's not, she's not trying to uh, leave them behind. So what happens then is interesting to me because Quentin runs out possibly intentionally in front of a car and dies, but he doesn't go away from the movie. And that's where the film seems a bit reminiscent of a Shakespeare play, but it's Hamlet rather than... And also maybe Clouds of Sils Maria. <gasps> um, and Personal Shopper, which is another Olivier Sayas. Yeah. That was, that was uh, 2016 in Cannes. Yeah, both of those have um, Kristen Stewart uh, giving roles that have given her a lot of cred that I think she deserves. I thought she was good in uh, Clouds of Sils Maria. I haven't seen Personal Shopper. Have you seen Personal Shopper? Yeah, I, I thought it was awful. You, well, I, I thought both those movies were pretty bad. You don't like this? Yeah. I like Clouds of Sils Maria that you, that for all of the underlying uh, lesbian s- subtext that was there. You have to pay off on that. You can't just have that hover uh, and not and and not have it. I I don't know, at, at least I, at, at least address it. At least address it because that's so much of that movie is that tension. 
And it it's never I, I it's think, never directly I think conf- that's, confronted. I think that movie is your uh your your Me Too times up movie about an abuse uh, a, a, of uh, sexual um exerting sexual power over a subordinate within the lesbian community. You know, I feel like that Really? That's what that movie's about. It's about her coming on to her employee. But she doesn't the gay really woman. she doesn't she, really come on to her. It's it's all implied. It's 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 subtext. You don't have to say it. It's still it's still abusive the way that you can exert that the energy that idea, and tension that over energy, people. That energy, that yeah. idea. I don't know. That maybe I, it's. I oh, think you're. I think that's what that movie's about. I, yeah, and that's really abstract and a big nothing burger. I think that that's what it's about. Is about how that is not a nothing burger. That that is a thing that you should think about is these relationships and that making it a lesbian one, a lesbian relationship or, you know, having, uh, but no, should be, uh, a woman and, and Stuart gay or straight. It doesn't matter is taking it out of the more familiar context for that. I don't know. I'm like, I'm, well, I'm, man, I'm, I'm you're re- th- reaching. I, I mean that I, I wish there was something to hang in a, a, a coat on there, but go it, back and watch it. Isn't. It's, it's, I believe it. I don't want to, I don't need to see it again. I saw it once. I, I was there. It wasn't my favorite movie of the year, but I thought it was kind of obviously about that inappropriate relationship. But it is unstated, and I don't think Kristen Stewart would never say it out loud. You know, yeah, I don't I know. There's, I, there's this, a lot of people I, would see that I movie and be like, I, 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 "I've had this, a job I, just like I, that." I, it was I think, super I weird. Think this whole well, anytime you're somebody's personal assistant, guess what? It's Personal, and I just think the idea of you know, a, so you just like put it up with it. You should, you should. Nobody, Reba should come on to you like that. She didn't come on to her. I, I, she definitely did. There's definitely boundaries crossed there. Tell me, dude, it was like three years ago. Yeah, I mean, I'm not gonna be able to cite my uh, text. I mean, I, I just, I think we, we should do it on the show. I mean, if you, you can know, put up with uh, it, I can't. I really can't. Or let's let's use this movie for example. Let's talk about this movie, right? Is you know, if if you if you leave. Uh, an opportunity if she was um, uh, offended by the director uh, coming on to her and left that's clearly going to hurt her career and I think we've heard a million stories about this of people saying it's like sure I thought the only thing that she walked out of was the good thing she had going she Um, abandoned the play that she was in right so she's you know she's not leaving the things that she should be leaving well this movie I think is not the this is the tale of someone who is who's damaged and is and is not making decisions for their own well being. So you know, am I going to try to? You well, know, that's times the thing. up this one. No, this this movie is something else, and but I think it's all, interesting. But they're they're all okay. they're all damaged. I think they're that's, all. I think that's, that's correct. They're all damaged people, and the one person who who um, Pulo played by Wadek Stanch Sansek. I don't know how to say his last name. He sounds um like Czech. Yeah, um, he's great. Uh, but when he has his big uh, fight with uh, Scru- Quentin? Scru- oh, no, the director. Scrutzler. The director. Jean-Louis Trentignat's character, and he yells at him, and he accuses him of using his power to try and seduce Nina, which is exactly not what he's doing. Which is also... <laughs> so he's the one person... The director is the one good guy. It, it almost sounds like... Um, I mean, I was going to say, it sounds like a, a film director is trying to make it clear that directors are the good guys, and it's all those other guys you are going to treat you like shit. It's all those poor little punks on the street of France that just work at real estate offices. They're the bad guys. I'm, I'm going to be a father figure and buy you oysters and look at you a certain way, and maybe if you want to. But, you know, I'm not going to force myself on you. you know, he's Well, there is this thing where he is a more of a patriarchal he doesn't aggressively put moves onto her he's still clearly being like i mean but if you're down you know that's the one thing he's doing is he he's not touching her without consent but he's taking her to a private room buying her uh, oysters also she's clearly unqualified <laughs> she's she, the movie it, why is she cast in the film right well i think in, she in, I, in the play I, I think that she's cast in the play because she was Quentin's girlfriend at the time that Quentin died, and so he yeah, he, he 
the, the, the director and who knows, maybe the director really is gay and he really did have uh, an affair with Quentin and he's super imposing or substituting um, Nina for his uh, affection for Quentin. It's a portrayal of people in the creative profession as using their jobs as excuses to just have random conversations with people, you know, and they, 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 they see him auditioning people and they show decent person after decent person, but he wants to cast the one girl who he has a personal stake in getting to, to know better and has a question for it. So if he's not trying to have sex with her and he's just trying to understand Quentin, it's like, you're a terrible director, man. <laughs> like, what are you doing? Well, it's he, either way, he's a terrible director, but I don't know if he's a terrible director because I think he probably got a much better performance out of Nina. Yeah, Nina does that than, happen? We don't than, really see her. We don't. We don't like. Does she? No, we don't get to see. She, we yeah, don't get to see that performance. You kind of wish it's like, but oh, what, she's the greatest Juliet ever. You're not what sure I, what no, the intent what, is. What I like is is how he leaves after the, after the performance. As soon as oh, yeah. as soon as the curtain's about to go up, I fulfilled my contract. I've done my job. Good night. That is a weird thing about theater that I've always noticed is yeah the director is there for maybe the first week of the run and then they're gone yeah i'll talk to actors and i'll say do you get together with your director after each show and like oh he's fucking gone you know he's doing another show it's yeah it's an odd thing The time for notes has passed that ship has sailed it's a bit like making a movie you know once it's in theaters for a year you're not going to every screen making sure that they've lined it up right and that the colors look good you're making your next thing but it's an inter- it's an interesting movie to look at. Uh, it really captures some good, some great performances from Julia Binoche and Jean Louis Trentignard, who's always terrific. Uh, of course, it was was the conformist in the Bertolucci film, played the the title character, as it were. And uh, most recently, or not most recently, but currently, is in the Michael Haneke film. Uh, happy ending, which I'm sad to say I did not like. This is the first Michael Hanukkah movie that I, I've not enjoyed very much at all. Can we talk about the resolution, the quite literal climax of it? She finally meets up with... Oh, uh, the scene? Paulo, and... So she, he's he's finagled his way back into... Or she comes after him. She yeah. comes she comes to him. Some time and, has passed. And, and, the and, by, the, and by this happened. time, we kind of get the idea that the older woman who who, who runs the, the realty firm has the hots for him. She's, she gives him one of these, you know, maybe love was right in front of you all along. No, it's, her line is actually good. He's, he's, um, he's, he says, I've gotten over her. It's a big world out there. And she goes, no, Paula, it is a very small world. Oh yeah, that's I a good like line. that. I like that line. Yeah, that's one of the best lines in the in the movie. So then, so then, but here she is. Here's Nina, and Nina makes it very clear that she's hot to trot, and she wants Willow right now. And why? What's happened? There's like, and I think that we haven't said is, despite all of his uh, attempt to thrust himself on her and her later just offering herself to him they've actually never had intercourse and so one thing that i only realized then is that uh, the tension of the movie if there's a there's a intention running through it that's being obstructed is is that they've never boned that's why i say it's like an erotically charged thing more than romance is like it it seems like there is a sexual tension which has never been discharged and that's the discharge th- there is a, line of the there is there is a bill that has come due yeah in that's that's that's, that's right it ends they don't run off into the sunset together they well, have a very they have well, a great i'm sure you want to talk about the scene it's it's well, very it, intense it, and passionate it, it, it ends because uh he he doesn't give a flying fuck anymore and the scene itself the way that it plays out she it, she allows him to humiliate her and he is only too happy to comply. It's it's, it's kind of it's, it's really gross. It's an Emmy. There's a lot of spitting and spitting and come on the face and is it is it it might have isn't spit is it come no 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 when yeah, she first come when she yeah, first yeah, yeah there, there there's okay. there's the there's the come to which he adds a, a lot of spit. No, it's it's really 
It's out there. What is it's it? It's really what out is there. It's, 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 I've never seen a scene like that. It's degradating to her, and it's hard to see this as uplifting to her. It's The movie ends with this graphic sexual violence put onto her. They don't have a connection. It's not in the context of them being... Uh, she uh, wants a connection. She tries to to have it mean something. But, so is this it, is it misogynist? Is it is this is this a, a scene of sexual violence against a woman who absolutely didn't put herself that's, out? That, and, and and is the movie that's what I think is the movie misogynist though because of that. Well, is, that, are we are we with Paulo and being this is cool? You've had this coming. You little tease. You minx. It's I didn't, I didn't have that experience. Did you? Um. I think I was pretty. I think this. I think uh, I was pretty appalled by the scene when it happened. Yeah, and I, I mean, of course, yeah, I'm a, I'm appalled by it, but I'm trying to see if the movie is wanting me to have that reaction, and if it's not, what is this, what is its point? And if it is, well, what see, is its well, point? well, this is what I think is a difference between French films and, and and American films. For one thing, you would you would never see half of it, uh, of this kind of content in a French film, it, I mean, in an American, American film, film it, would, it would never be that daring. And so that's one of the things that I applaud about the film is that it's not, it's not giving you those easy answers. I don't think, you know, this is a, it's a situation where you can say, you know, what's the, you know, is the intent of the film this or that it's, it's up to you to, to decide that, but one thing that but there's you, one, a perspective on events. Well, a bit. well, what what you see is that uh, people are seldom what they say they are, and people, you you know, they'll they'll lead you down the primrose path, pretending to be one thing, and then all of a sudden, it could be six months later or a year later, and you discover, oh, lo and behold, they're the complete opposite. The way that they've been acting for the past year has all been bullshit just to get you to this one little thing, and now they're done, and they're gone. Has that ever happened to you in your life? Yeah, of course. Yeah, and there, there, <coughs> there is a true-to-life element to the way these characters treat each other and the blow-by-blow -blow specifics of what it's like that reminds you of your early 20s. It reminds you of being around troubled, creative people. You know, it's shocking to see it on film, but if you told this narratively to mm -hmm. me as mm -hmm. something that someone went through in New York in yeah. college, yeah, you'd say, "Oh yeah, no, yeah, stuff like that happened to me. I was in a bad place. I did something like that. I understand that. Not rape, you know, but yeah. treating people uh, very unfairly and from a place of being damaged." And French film explores that much more viscerally realistically and honestly and honestly and 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 but you know, but still you know puts enough narrative embellishment into the the story that you feel like uh, you're connected to the story and you understand the setting that you know here's this actress and she's gonna be she's gonna be a muse of however, whatever, you know, distorted quality to whoever, whatever male of distorted intention. And that's, that's the nature of the beast. That's, that's, but, that's what's going what on it, in Paris at it, that time. What it gets across, and I think is what makes it very topical rewatch for now, is this woman from a small town shows up to the big city of Paris, and it's like they can sharks that can smell the blood in the water yeah. and she has an attitude that is like i'm going to fend for myself i'm going to they're going to use sexuality against me i'm going to use it back and i don't think women can win at this game i i think it is rigged for men because ultimately that's a game of violence yeah and it's dark it doesn't end with a murder but it it ends with it ends with uh, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. You know, she, she's she's sort of uh, she's made um, she's made a, a dress out of the curtains and is presenting herself, and he, you know, wipes himself on her and walks away. It's very uh, Rex Butlery. Yeah, it, it, it's unsatisfying. 
Is that right? Rex Butler? Right? Uh, uh, Rhett, 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 Rhett Butler. Rhett Butler. I yeah. like Rex. Who's this Rex Butler of which you speak? Yeah. Um. He, <laughs> he, uh, he's like Rex Harrison. He, he, he talks yeah. things, but with a Southern accent. Red, yeah, Red Butler. Well, I, I wouldn't put it in Red Butler terms because Vivian Lee's character worked him over so hard in that movie. Oh, she had it coming? I gotta, you know, I gotta... Have you, have you seen have you seen Gone, Gone with the Wind? It's been like maybe twenty years. Oh, you and should so, you should you should re- read my review of Gone with the Wind. Gone, Gone with the Wind. I'll watch it. I'll, uh, I'll read your review, but I'll, yeah. I'll also watch it. Yeah, no, I did. I did a video essay on it as well. Anyway, it's a really interesting movie. Julie Binoche is absolutely stunning. Great, great actress. Really fun to look at, and I love the scenes with, with she and Jean Louis Trentignat. And uh, it's an interesting. A slice of slice of French cinema from the mid eighties. I yeah, and um, what I'll say about it is, I think it's it's a good time to rewatch it. Plenty of things that are problematic and topical and topical, and um, you may hate the film, but unlike some others that are dealing with dangerous things uh, or you know very intense things, it you're in you're in pretty safe hands. Yeah, you know, you're in pretty safe hands. We're gonna talk about another movie soon, which I don't know what kind of hands we're in when we're dealing with, with, with uh, misogyny and, and violence against women. I, I don't know what. I don't know. What how, I, I, yeah, I don't know that. how that discussion is gonna go either. Yeah, but this one is it's gonna push you to some some hard places, but will ultimately leave you thinking and. Uh, considering things and from it's, a different it, shout out to filmstruck it's streaming on filmstruck right now if you are so inclined to dial it up and i want to thank you all very much for listening i hope that you will go to um our patreon page at colesmithy.com you can find it there and contribute your monthly support to help keep le grand Bouffe, the big feast coming every week and uh you, of course there you can find the archive of all of our past episodes and also feel free to reach out to us and tell us what you like and what you don't like and if you have any ideas for movies or beers let us know you can always email me directly at colesmithy at gmail.com and uh youtube check out our stuff on youtube you know if you got the youtube red it's easier for you to stream it there just set it on loop and uh you know this little ad money can tinkle in we don't mind that yeah, I don't know. I think I've made ten dollars from 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 YouTube. I I don't think YouTube pays anything at all. We just got to get all of our fans to stream the episode six hundred times, and once we do that, then we it's sort of a pyramid scheme. If you get five people to subscribe <laughs> to like Ron Booth, and you get them to subscribe, it's multi level marketing has not penetrated the Facebook space. I don't I don't think multi level marketing has penetrated anything ever. <laughs> but that's that's just me. It's penetrated a lot of pocketbooks, I tell you that. Yeah. Sorry, everybody. Okay. Alright, well anyway, please remember to turn your cell phones off when you're walking, driving, riding a bicycle, or watching a movie.